Welcome, everybody. Thanks for coming again to Plato Frontiers and Life Sciences. Next week, where will you be? At all. Not here. Because <laughs> okay. it's Wednesday before Thanksgiving, and we will do not meet then. In two weeks, John Chutsky from uh, Biological Systems Engineering will be here to talk about the future of farm safety. And that'll be the last talk of, of the fall. And then we'll fire it up back in the spring. So if you would like to send Paul or me or both any ideas for speakers or topics, that would be great. I can work on that over the uh, Christmas holiday. And if you have, um, what other thing? Da, da, da. Yeah, that's pretty much it. And then tonight at Wednesday night at the lab. You disappeared. I disappeared. <laughs> Why is this thing being difficult? Mm -hmm. that do it again? Well, I don't yeah, now I'm sideways again, so you'll just have to tilt it. Try to jiggle it. <laughs> Would you like to join the audio to speak later? There we go. Yeah. Who recovering, knows? recovering. <laughs> what? Why things are wobbling in the universe. It is beyond me. Okay. Meanwhile, back at the ranch tonight, Mark Kapelovich from the Pollitt School for Public Affairs and the Department of Political Science is going to talk about inflation, the global economy, and the consequences of the midterm election. Next week at Wednesday Night Lab will also go dark, and then we'll be back in two weeks for a talk on solar electricity from photovoltaic panels and how that's changed over the last 10 years. And that speaker will be Michael Arnold. Michael Arnold. All right, here we go. Now we count to 10,000 slowly. <laughs> Welcome everybody to Plato Frontiers in Life Sciences. I'm Tom Zinna, and I work at the Biotechnology Center at UW Madison, and I also work for the Division of Extension in Wisconsin 4-H. Thanks again for coming to Plato Frontiers in Life Sciences. Tonight, today, I'm delighted to introduce to you Elizabeth Berryman. She's with the Department of Botany, and I'm going to ask her the five questions. You can answer these in any way you would like. Oh. Remember, it doesn't have to be true, it just has to be believable. Elizabeth, where were you born? Madison, Wisconsin. <laughs> Where did you go to high school? Middleton High School. <laughs> oh, Cardinals. Yep, go Car Cardinals. And then where did you go for your undergrad and what did you study? I went here for my undergrad um, and I studied biology. And then are you, do you, you're now in your PhD program? Yes, I'm in the PhD program in the Department of Botany. Okay, yes. that'll be great. Today you're going to talk with us about these things called escort. Escort proteins, I'm assuming is pronounced. Yep. And they mediate things. Yes, they do. <laughs> degradation of plants. Oh, look, my picture is blocking it. Anyway, it's about plant membranes. And you're going to have some really great pictures to show us because yes. the lab that you work in is also a lab and uh, that does some fantastic imaging. So would Thank you please you. join me in welcoming Elizabeth Berry? Thank you. Uh, thank you for inviting me today. I'm very excited to be talking to you all. Um, yes, I'm in my second year of the graduate program. I started um, in fall of 2021 um, after I graduated from my bachelor's in the spring of 2021. And um, I rotated through three labs in botany, all studying plant physiology. And then in January, I started on my research project studying the role of escort proteins, um, which mediate protein degradation. Um, in all cells, but we study them specifically in plants. So I can get going here. Oh. How do I go to the next slide? I'll just have to click next. Yep. All right. So uh, 
Um, an overview of my presentation, I will first give a description of um, the escort proteins and how they mediate degradation of plasma membrane proteins. And then I will talk about some of the tools that we have for researching plant cell biology um, at different scales. And finally, I'll talk about um, some of the recent discoveries in the Otegi lab um, with respect to unique escort function in plant cells and um, what I'm doing for my research project. So let's start with this first point here. So here we have a plant cell and um, all cells have a, a plasma membrane surrounding them, which uh, separates them um, from their environment. The plasma membrane is made of lipids. And um, so the lipids are represented in green here in the membrane, um, but also in the plasma membrane are proteins, which are embedded there. And so these proteins are very important because they allow the cell to interact with its environment. Um, for example, two different kind of uh, plasma membrane proteins are shown here. The bottom one um, is a uh, representing a channel, which can allow certain nutrients to pass through the plasma membrane into the cell. Um, another type of uh, integral uh, protein here would be a receptor, and uh, receptors can bind things like hormones in the extracellular space, um, and that can signal uh, things to ha happen in the plant cell um, as a response. So um, because of this very important interaction of uh, proteins for the cell and its environment, um, all cells regulate which proteins are in the plasma membrane at any given time. And they do this um, all the time, very dynamically. So um, sometimes certain plasma membrane proteins are uh, needing to be removed from the plasma membrane. This is because either they're not needed anymore for the cell function or because they're dysfunctional and they need to be uh, degraded. So when this is the case, um, the cell can remove actually this whole area of the, the plasma membrane containing the proteins which need to be degraded by grabbing the lipids and the proteins here and uh, pulling that area into the cell um, in the form of a vesicle. So um, now we've removed those proteins and the lipids surrounding them from the plasma membrane. And so these can be sent for degradation. There are a few steps which I didn't show here um, for the sake of clarity because we don't study uh, those steps, but we study the role of escort proteins in this degradation pathway. Um, so I will talk about that part of the process next. Um, so when these uh, plasma membrane proteins, which I will also refer to as cargo, it's less of a mouthful, um, are uh, traveling to the site of protein degradation. At one point, they are delivered to an organelle called a multivesicular endosome. So this organelle um, is derived from the trans-Golgi network. It has a membrane um, on the outside of it that the protein cargos are delivered to. And escort proteins um, which are located in the cytoplasm of the cell, go to the multivesicular endosome, bind these uh, protein cargos, and push them onto the inside of the multivesicular endosome in yet another type of vesicle. So the escort proteins stand for endosomal sorting complex required for transport. Um, so like the name entails, these proteins sort the protein cargo into vesicles within the endosome, and you can see this here. So now instead of the proteins being located on the endosomal membrane, we have them internalized into the inside of the endosome. So uh, this endosome will then go to the site of protein degradation in the cell. In plant cells, this is called the vacuole. And uh, the vacuole also has a membrane uh, surrounding it. The multivesicular endosome can move to the vacuole and fuse with it. So when it fuses with the vacuole, all of these vesicles, which the escort proteins have created, get released to the inside of the vacuole. And these uh, protein cargos can be degraded. They're degraded to their basic building blocks, and those building blocks are recycled back to the cell for further use. 
Um, this is important, as I said, for plant cells um, in uh, protein degradation and nutrient recycling, but it's also important in all cellular organisms. Um, and I can show you why. Um, so uh, from the research that's been done on this process, we know what happens when escort proteins are not functional in uh, this protein degradation pathway. So instead of the protein cargo getting uh, delivered to the multivesicular endosome and being sorted into the endosome, they stay on the outside. And this is because the escort proteins aren't able to form the vesicles. Then when uh, the multivesicular endosome goes to the vacuole and fuses with it, all of those proteins, instead of being delivered to the inside of the vacuole, get stuck on this outer membrane. And so this causes abnormal protein accumulation in the uh, vacuole membrane, and also we're not able to degrade the proteins that we need to degrade, and those nutrients aren't able to be reused in the cell. So is that a double membrane on the red vesicle there? Um, so this, uh, I made my figures with BioRender. This is um, a representation of a vacuole. So I would take with a grain of salt the, the biological relevance of the, the dark coloring here. I don't think so. Um, so uh, when we have uh, defective escort proteins in plants, we see a range of, of traits that uh, result. They have uh, different levels of defects depending upon the importance of this protein uh, in the protein degradation pathway. Um, and they're not only important in plants, but also in animals in uh, fruit flies, which is another common, uh, commonly researched organism. Um, uh, abnormalities in escort proteins can result in uh, abnormal tissue growths on the eyes, wings, and legs of the uh, fruit flies. And this is all from the improper degradation of uh, certain receptors, which are important for development. And in humans, um, diseases like Alzheimer's uh, can actually result from non-functional escort proteins. So Alzheimer's, but also other neurological diseases like ALS and dementia result from from um, the aggregation of proteins in um, neurons. Is that what they refer to as plaque? Uh, plaque? Yeah, with uh, Alzheimer's. Um, I'm not sure if they call it plaques. I've uh, read about it as protein aggregates. Okay. So it very well maybe. Okay, so um, why do we uh, study escort proteins in plants? Well, as I uh, explained earlier about the nutrient recycling, functional escort proteins means that we have um, very efficient uh, plants with their nutrient use. And here's a, a picture of a farm in Dane County, very well-kept farm. We put a lot of effort into making sure our plants have enough nutrients. Um, they fertilize the soil. These nutrients in the soil are taken up into the plant roots and used by the plants to create things like proteins. So um, when these escort proteins aren't functional, we're needing more nutrients or just not using these nutrients as efficiently as we could be. Um, we do this um, instead of directly in plants like corn. Um, we use this because these plants and they have fast generation times, um, but they also have a gene has been done in these plants. So we have a good amount of background knowledge of what various genes are doing in these plants. Um, before I move on, scale that we're looking at these cellular structures. So um, a plant cell uh, ranges from 10 to 100 micrometers in size. And so if we uh, take, you know, something in the middle of that, I think I did 55 micrometers when I was doing this calculation, and we equivalent, uh, make that equivalent to the length of like a football field, which is 100 yards. When we're um, comparing that to the size of the multivesicular endosome, where our escort proteins are functioning, 
um, that would be about 1.6 yards on the football field. And then when we look at the size of uh, the area in the vesicle that the escorts are forming, that would be just 0 0.08 yards or like 2.7 inches. So it's kind of even too small to see on my little cartoon representation here. So we're talking about very tiny structures in the cell. Um, and so we have multiple tools to study these tiny things and their functions. Um, which I will be explaining next. Um, and if there are any questions, I'd be happy to take those now before moving on to this kind of different topic. All right. So why do these, why do these membrane proteins have to be turned over? So um, they're constantly changing. Uh, sometimes when cells are developing, they will take on a new function. And so they'll need to have quick uh, replacement um, but there can also be environmental stresses um, that, like, if they get a whole bunch of signals that there's some stress happening, um, the cell will need to, like, interpret different kinds of signals. So if um, it's needing to bolster itself because a, a bug is crawling on the leaf and, and eating it, it will be able to um, change how it uh, it interacts with the environment based on that. Why do the nutrients pass through? What, what's the energy that they can do those, those pores? Um, so there are different kinds of transport of nutrients. Um, sometimes it's just the uh, like um, amount of the nutrient on one side of the membrane versus the other, and it, it passes through um, the channel just kind of on its own. Other times, um, there is uh, the co-transport of uh, multiple things. Um, so there could be like a high, like a proton gradient that's that's higher on one side, and that gradient will actually drive the transport of another nutrient that isn't going to be brought across as a result of the, the nutrients concentration. Um, and then there's also uh, like antiporters, which, which uh, push one thing out of the cell and bring another thing into the cell. Um, so there are multiple different ways to do it. Yeah. All right. So um, the first thing we can do when we're studying uh, plant cell biology is we can look at the overall development of the plant. Here's an Arabidopsis seedling. Um, it's not growing on soil, it's, it's growing on an agarose gel with uh, nutrients in it. So we can, we can see the roots very well. Um, and one thing that we can do uh, if we're interested in how a gene functions is we can um, use genetic engineering to uh, disrupt the function of that gene so that it's not working anymore. And we can look at how the uh, plants look and see what defects they have. And that gives us a hint as to what these proteins are important for. So um, here are a number of uh, escort mutants that we have, which are plants with an individual escort protein um, in the complex that have been genetically engineered so that they're non-functional. Um, they have a broad range of phenotypes. So here's the wild type plant. This is the healthier Arabidopsis. Here is a LIP5 mutant. LIP5 is an escort component. Uh, here's a double mutant for ISTL1 and LIP5, which is uh, quite compromised in development compared to the single LIP5 mutant. And then here's a single CHIMP1 mutant, also an escort protein. And um, so we can see that some uh, proteins have a much larger impact on, on plant health than others in the escort complex. Uh, some defects that these plants experience are defects in cell expansion, root gravitropism, which is how roots sense uh, gravity and grow down instead of up, and then overall development. So um, we can also use microscopes to study uh, living cells in real time. So um, we can take one of these seedlings and look at its uh, roots under a light microscope like this one, which we use very frequently called a confocal microscope. Um, and this allows us to see overall cell structure and shape. We can take measurements of cells. Um, and as you can see, this cell is uh, emitting light. It's, it's, it's glowing around the, the edge of it. 
And we can make the cells do this either by staining them so that when we're looking at them under the light microscope, uh, certain stains can stain specific cell components. We can see those cell components clearly, but we can also genetically engineer um, proteins, um, which are capable of emitting fluorescence light. So um, some of you may have heard of GFP. It's a very popular uh, tool in uh, research. Um, but this GFP, which stands for green fluorescent protein, um, is actually uh, naturally occurring in some organisms. And so researchers found this protein and uh, through genetic engineering, linked GFP to other proteins that they're interested in. And so wherever that protein is in the cell, uh, since it has GFP on it now, that area will glow. Um, so here, this uh, uh, plasma membrane or cell wall, whichever is being stained, um, is either from being stained or because some protein in the cell wall or plasma membrane uh, was manufactured to have this uh, fluorescent signal on it. So um, we also have more powerful microscopes. This is uh, one that's in the center um, for quantitative cell imaging where my lab is. And um, it is a scanning transmission electron microscope. So instead of light microscopy. Now we are using electrons to uh, create our images that we are looking at. Um, however, we cannot look at living cells using this method. We just are looking at frozen or fixed cells. So instead of seeing uh, how a living cell is behaving, we are seeing a single snapshot, snapshot <laughs> of that cell at any given point in time. And um, the other thing that you can do with this microscope is take images at different angles. And uh, what this allows you to do is to uh, tilt your imaged specimen and create a 3D model of uh, that subcellular structure. So here uh, we are able to look at a 3D model of the organelle, the multivesicular endosome, which I described earlier. Um, this is from an actual um, electron tomogram taken using this microscope. And uh, these, these red markers here are just uh, points that we place in the vesicles so that we can easily see these vesicles. But um, in our program on our computer, we can actually rotate this. It's a 3D object. Um, we can also use these um, electron microscopes to visualize uh, uh, structures of proteins. So this is a purified escort protein, which has been imaged, and we can see that it's spontaneously forming in a spiral. So this is a useful tool for us to understand protein function, because even though we can't see it as it's acting live, we can see the structures that it is assembling in. Um, so... We also use computational simulations to simulate what might be happening um, in a living cell um, based upon uh, the information that we can collect from all these other sources. And I'll be talking about one of the computational simulations that we've done in our lab later in this presentation. So I'd be happy to take any questions. I see a message in the chat here. Should I click on that? My chat doesn't show up. Um, no, this is confirming my computer. Oh, great. So what kind of computers are you using for that computational? Are they in-house or are they supercomputers somewhere else? Um, they are there. I'm not sure exactly what kind of computer it is, though. I'm sorry. And what building are you in? Uh, we're in Bach Labs, which is uh, across the street from Ag Hall. So although you're in botany department, yeah, you're we're in Bach Labs. Yes. Yep. Now, when you're talking about the, the simulation, do you have like uh, the computer has like little models for each of the little parts in, inside of the cell, and then you kind of let them asynchronously interact with each other and just kind of uh, then, then compare what happens with the model with what happens in real life? Is that? Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, we use the information that we gather from our um, imaging and other approaches, genetics and, and biochemical approaches, and we can uh, set up a simulation with a set of parameters. So you, you know certain biological facts, you can use those as input parameters, then run a simulation 
and then compare the output and see if it's similar to what we're seeing in real life. Um, so I can explain a little bit more about how the simulations look later in the, in the presentation. All right. So um, escort proteins, so th those stand for endosomal sorting complex required for transport, um, they bend the multivesicular membrane away from the cytoplasm. So um, this is a model of what this uh, could look like. So here is the endosomal membrane, and th these are the escort proteins here. So these are functioning from the inside of the forming vesicle to trap our cargo that need to be sent for deg degradation into a vesicle within the uh, inside of the multivesicular endosome. And even after like a year of of reading and stuff, I really took a long time to visualize how this was happening um, from these models. So um, I wanted to show something which I thought was similar, uh, and that is blowing bubbles. Um, so there's an, the initial deformation of the, the bubble soap when you start blowing a bubble, and um, then more of the bubble soap goes in to form the bigger bubble, and then a uh, sort of neck of the forming bubble forms as the bubble's moving away, and that will kind of spontaneously separate. And this isn't totally biologically comparable to uh, vesicles formed by escort proteins, but at least it's a helpful visual. And so I took a video of this. So you can see the, the air deforming the bubble soap, and there are these sort of necks which uh, separate uh, from the, the bubble wand. Um, so I took some still frames of this and we can compare this to, to our cartoon model and hopefully it'll make it a little bit clear. But so instead of bubble soap, we have the endosomal limiting membrane and rather than air deforming the membrane, we have escort proteins, which bind our protein cargo and the membrane surface and they assemble, uh, to push the vesicle membrane into the, the lumen of the multivesicular endosome. There are many escort proteins in the escort complex, and they uh, sort of sequentially arrive and, and participate in each step of this vesicle formation process. Um, at the later stages, there is an enzyme uh, enzyme in the escort complex, which remodels all of the proteins that are already there, constricting the neck even further than it was already constricted. And um, before the vesicle is released, uh, the escort proteins actually lose contact with the protein cargo and are recycled back to the cytoplasm. Then we have our completed uh, vesicle after the membrane scissions off. Well, how long is that process? Oh, it's very fast. I do not know the exact numbers, but it it's a quick process. So minutes, seconds. seconds, less than seconds. Yes. And uh, so my lab was interested in how this is happening in plants. Oh, I wanted to mention before we move on that these models um, were developed uh, in yeast. This process was re researched in yeast first. So this this is what we knew about this from work done in yeast uh, before, before it was seen in plants. So now we have an electron tomogram of a multivesicular endosome in one of our plants. So here is the membrane of the multivesicular endosome. And again, these uh, organelles are between 200 and 500 nanometers, which would be like 1.6 yards on the 100 yard football field. Um, and uh, we are able to take images using this microscope kind of going in the Z direction. So actually this is a video that I'm going to show. It's going to move into the screen and we're gonna see a single snapshot, snap, oh my goodness, snapshot of the multivesicular endosome, um, but we're going to be moving through it. We're gonna see the whole thing. Um, these dark spots, are markers that are purposely placed there so that as we are uh, moving through this, we have a concept of where we are in the cell. It's just for our visual reference. So we're moving into the screen now. Here's a vesicle connected to the limiting membrane. Here they are. 
So we're still moving forward. Then the video is going to stop and it's going to come back through the same sample. All right, now we're coming back. And you might notice something as you're looking at this. Here are some more vesicles over here. So it's easier to, to realize this when you look at the 3D model from this endosome, but actually these vesicles are not forming individually, they're forming all connected to each other. And this was not characterized in yeast. So this was a novel discovery of something that is um, happening in the plant cells mediated by the escort proteins in plants specifically. So uh, this is our wild type. So that's our, our normal plant, um, the multivesicular endosome. And what my lab named these were networks of concatenated vesicles. So um, the connections between these vesicles are actually the membrane from the multivesicular endosome itself. So at some point during the escort activity on the endosomal membrane, as they're forming these vesicles, they are not scissioning the vesicle, but they are constructing restricting the neck and forming more vesicles somehow. And so since this discovery, this was published in 2017, this has been the foundation for a lot of the future research that has been uh, done in my lab. And this is the foundation of my, my research project as well. So we want to know how concatenated vesicles form. Again, since we can't observe this process live, we can look at multiple snapshots in time. I got it that time. And um, see if we can kind of piece together what's happening. So in these snapshots, we can see a sort of stepwise formation of these connected vesicles, um, where here's the endosomal limiting membrane and the vesicle being deformed initially by the escort proteins out here. Um, then the vesicle neck is constricted. So there will be escort proteins in here doing the action of constricting this vesicle neck. And then instead of it being released, another vesiculation event happens. Um, and so this results in linearly connected vesicles and this can go on and on. So this is what my lab uh, deemed a single budding site. There's a single domain on the endosomal membrane, which is continuously internalizing proteins in these vesicles. However, there was a, another structure which cannot be explained this way. And this is when these vesicles form at the, at the limiting membrane but they also have a lateral bit bridge between them. And so this is what it looks like in our 3D models. And this is our hypothesis of what is going on, but we still do not fully understand why this is happening or how the escort proteins are doing this. So here are our escort proteins, which we know form these spiral structures. Um, and we think maybe they're congregating on a small area on the endosomal membrane and pushing these uh, uh, vesicles out close to each other and somehow they are forming lateral bridges. So now we have a new mechanism altogether for uh, endosomal vesicle formation compared to the original yeast model where the escort proteins are forming vesicles one by one and then these escort proteins get recycled back to the cytoplasm. We know that that's not happening in plants. What's happening instead is the vesicles are forming in networks and the escort Proteins are actually being retained in these uh, vesicle necks. So what that means is that when this multivesicular endosome fuses with the vacuole, it will release this whole network into the inside of the vacuole. And not only will the protein cargoes get degraded, the escort proteins will as well. So um, the plant MVs have concatenated vesicles, but the open questions still are, what is the purpose of this? We don't want to degrade escorts, we need them. So why is the plant willingly getting rid of them? Um, and how are the escorts creating these unique vesicle networks functionally? So um, we can research this using multiple, uh, multiple different kinds of tools. Like I described earlier, we can use genetics to knock out certain escort components and see uh, how the protein trafficking is affected in the cells. Here are two different escort mutants, one for the escort component LIP5, another one for CHIMP1. Um, and uh, we can use that GFP fluorescent protein that I discussed earlier and link it 
to a plasma membrane cargo. So we can see wherever these cargos are in the cell. And what we see with these escort mutants is that not only here's a wild type cell, we see signal in the plasma membrane here and here, just in the plasma membrane of these cells. But in the escort mutant, we see signal both in the plasma membrane and at the vacuole. So here's another example. Here's, uh, can't quite tell what I'm pointing at, but it's um, signal coming from these circular vacuole structures as well. And so we know that uh, in these mutants, protein degradation is failing. And our, uh, this is a specific protein called PIN3. Our PIN3 plasma membrane protein is getting stuck in the vacuole membrane and rather than being degraded, and it's causing some bad implications for the health of these of these plants. Yes. Why does the chimp worm grow at all? Why does it grow at all, even though it's got these horrible defects yeah. in protein trafficking? Um, well, there could be multiple reasons. It could be partially degrading proteins. Um, so actually, these are uh, seedling lethal. They do not survive long. Um, and that could be like, over time, the protein accumulates too much in the vacuoles and the cell just isn't able to function anymore. Um, and uh, the LIP5 has the same pro problem going on. It also is not uh, degrading proteins properly, but um, for some reason it's able to uh, develop normally under favorable conditions. So there's either some pathway that's compensating for the lack of this particular protein. There could be a redundantly functioning protein in the escort complex. Um, and for the, this protein, there could be no, no compensating protein for its lack of function, um, uh, or there could be something, something else going on. And then we can also use our electron microscopes to uh, take tomograms of our multivesicular endosomes to see what is structurally happening at our endosomes um, and in what ways are our escort mutants having defects. So compared to wild type, you can see lots of vesicles which are marked with the red markers inside the vesicles. And um, we can quantify which vesicles are connected to each other. Uh, so how many bridges are, are linking all of them. Um, and then in the LIP5 mutant, we see many fewer vesicles and also less concatenation of those vesicles. Uh, the same goes for the chimp one mutant. So something in the uh, uh, pathway when they're creating these vesicles is failing and they're not able to successfully form as many vesicles. Um, but also in the chimp one mutant, we see some instances of really long vesicle necks. So something is happening where uh, the necks aren't being scissioned, uh, or there's too much of a certain type of protein accumulating there, um, or maybe the new vesicles that were supposed to form on top of that aren't forming anymore. It could go on and on with the hypotheses, but we see different sort of phenotypes with each, with each mutant. So um, trying to figure out why this might be beneficial for plants, we had this hypothesis. Maybe the concatenation captures more cargo proteins to be degraded. So maybe there's a, a significant advantage to forming vesicles in this way in plants. Um, but we can't observe this in real time. So we used a computational simulation to see the relative speed of uh, protein cargo loss in different vesicle geometries to see if maybe in the concatenated vesicles, we have less protein loss, protein cargo loss. So here, uh, we have uh, our first vesicle geometry, one vesicle, then uh, two vesicles were also tested, and three. And um, so we uh, took a plasma membrane protein called PIN2 and placed a number of them at this far end, you know, in our computational simulation, placed a number of them in this far end of the vesicle bud. And with we, what we know about how fast these proteins move through membranes, we uh, ran the simulation to see how long it took for a number of them to escape out of this vesicle structure. Um, so here uh, is a quantification of the simulation. On the uh, y-axis, we see the number of proteins, uh, the number of PIN2 proteins in the vesicle. 
um, and uh, time on the x-axis. So when there is only one vesicle bud, the amount of pin proteins in the vesicle decreases rapidly um, in a matter of uh, less than 20 milliseconds these proteins have diffused out of the vesicle. And uh, when we increase the geometry to two vesicle buds, that time becomes significantly longer. And same goes for the three vesicle bud geometry. However, uh, based on the time that we know it must take to form these vesicles, this is still very fast for um, the, the proteins to be diffusing away and we're not capturing them in these vesicles anymore. So um, there must be something in addition to this geometry uh, acting as a diffusion barrier. And so that's what we think the escort proteins are doing by being retained in these vesicle networks. Not only are they maybe uh, blocking the uh, diffusion of protein cargos out just by creating this geometry, but also they're creating a diffusion barrier here at each vesicle neck. And um, so there were other uh, areas of this research project that um, combined more evidence through uh, biochemistry to show this, but we did find that the escort proteins are retained at the vesicle bridges and are serving, serving as diffusion barriers to prevent cargo escape. Um, so that was interesting, but we still don't know how the escorts are making these concatenated vesicles. And so that is what our research is now. And this is what my research is focusing on. So um, a number of us in the lab are, are studying uh, escort proteins. Each of us has a different escort protein that we're are focusing on to try and figure out what the functions um, are and how their functions contribute to the concatenated vesicles specifically. So it's likely not the action of a single escort protein, but it's probably the combined interaction of a number of these proteins in the complex, which are resulting in their unique um, uh, structures in plants compared to other organisms. Um, I also applied to uh, the NSF Graduate Research Fellowship Program for this research. When I was invited to this talk, I said, yes, I could, I would love to come, but I can't come until November because I'm, I'm working on a fellowship proposal. I said, oh, the GRFP, thank you so much. Uh, yeah, please talk about the, that during the talk. That would be very uh, interesting to us. Um, so the National Science Foundation uh, funds research by graduate students. Um, and they, they fund that student individually for, for three years so that they're able to do their research project. And they're looking for um, outstanding graduate students who have demonstrated their potential to be high achieving scientists and engineers early in their careers. Um, so the application consists of two pieces. One is a personal and uh, relevant background um, and future goals statement. So that's three pages. And then um, your actual research proposal, which is two pages. So in just five pages, you try and explain the things that you're doing, what you're working on, why it's very interesting, and that they should um, fund you. And they review you on your intellectual merit and broader impacts. So um, in terms of intellectual merit uh, for the uh, potential of this research to advance knowledge and understanding within its own field um, or across different fields, that would be escort proteins role in protein degradation and cell function um, in plants, but really in all cellular organisms. And so it's beneficial to do this research in plant cells um, not just for, for understanding plant function, but also for understanding um, other escorts and other organisms. So maybe we found this concatenation in plants and it's really unique to plants and there are unique escort proteins in plants causing this, but maybe this is happening, you know, at a low level in, in other organisms. And so this would be very interesting to know for, for yeast and for humans. Um, and then they also look at the, the benefits to society or advance, uh, ability of the research to advanced desired societal outcomes. Um, and so this would be improving plant nutrient use through um, understanding escort function, but also um, as a result of us doing research, our ability to um, do a scientific outreach to local communities, like what I'm doing today, explaining my research. If, if I didn't have funding, I wouldn't be here explaining the research that I'm doing. Um, and uh, also uh, 
developing educational um, activities for for younger kids and inspiring them to to get involved in science. Um, so yeah, I have some more details of the the um, parts of the research plan that they evaluate, um, which I put there. Um, but I think with that, I would like to. Uh, wrap up the presentation and acknowledge uh, people who have been doing this research. Uh, those publications from 2017 were the result of uh, uh, work by past lab members, um, our, our current lab members, and my, my lab director, and in addition to our collaborators who are the mathematicians that develop the commuta computational simulations that, that we use for uh, parts of this research, and then our funding, which is also from the NSF. Um, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Yes. Yeah. When those escort proteins are broken down, do they get like totally broken down and ejected, or this maybe like keep some big components there? They're ejected, and then they kind of reassemble from from uh, partially constructed parts. I think they're totally broken down to um, the amino acids that they're constructed okay. of. So the amino acids can be used to create new proteins, um, but I don't think they're partially there anymore after getting delivered to the, okay, so the vacuole. I was thinking like if you had Newton um, escort proteins, um, they're, they're just Newton because that's the way the cell builds them. Yes, we we create uh, mutations in the genetic sequence yeah, itself yeah. in the genome. And yeah. so when the cell goes to create these proteins yeah, and they, they yeah. go to the gene, they are assembling a gene that has a problem for one reason or another, and the protein will not be functional. Yeah. Do you have any conditional mutants where the, the mutants could be turned on or turned off? We don't, I think. Um, I was actually thinking about this the other day, like a, a system to create a mutation only when um, it, you you want to see uh, changes. And I think there are some uh, ways to do that. Um, there are certainly ways to uh, induce the like fluorescent signals from different cell components based upon reactions that are happening in the cell. Um, but yeah, as as far as creating mutants that way, I'm not sure what the what our capabilities are. Yes, I'm not too familiar with the cell biology, but I'm just curious. There's all this interesting stuff that's happening on the member. Of all these little components, but is the membrane itself on all the components? Is that identical? Is no. That, okay. Yeah, there are different lipids um, that have different charges and sizes um, that actually create a specific identity for for different organelles and, and different membrane surfaces. Mm -hmm. So is that generally, how different components decide to kind of get close to each other. Or? Yeah, it's definitely um, the escort proteins are recruited um, to specific type of types of lipids and combined with certain types. So where the escort proteins are in the cell is at certain organelles with certain lipid identities. Okay, yeah, yes. Last question. Have there been isolated temperature sensitive mutants in plants? Temperature sensitive? Yeah. Yes. Um, so actually our... Um, our LIP5 mutant is um, healthier in high heat than it is in low heat. And that's because um, it has a constitutively expressed uh, protein that is um, for defense. So it feels like it's constantly under attack. So it its ability to grow normally is quite dependent on the temperature because when you put it in higher temperature, I think uh, the expression of that defense uh, mechanism uh, decreases quite a bit. Yeah. I'm sure there are many other uh, temperature sensitive mutants and, and also uh, mutants which are less sensitive to temperature changes that are being studied, especially for applications with global warming and making plants that can deal in higher pressures or higher temperatures. And then sometimes you don't even have to have a mutant, just shifting the temperature. Um, up to 32, 35 degrees centigrade will significantly change how the plant responds. That was something I got to do when I was working on uh, plant virus infection. 
Mm -hmm. And so it's great to have the temperature sensitivity, but sometimes you just have a wild type and it'll change. But if people don't grow them at two different temperatures, you just it, you may not even realize that that's something that you can look at. Um, yeah, with our escort mutants, we we try and have them in different sort of environments, so uh, exposed to higher temperatures, um, other stressful environmental conditions like pathogens. Um, uh, things like that, and we see how the plants respond, and some mutants respond in dramatically different ways. Can you tell us about your undergraduate experience? Did you do research as an undergraduate? I did. Um, I did research in two labs um, here at the UW. Um, the first lab I was in was also in the botany department, and it was actually um, studying the origin of life, so that was more uh, biochemistry and, and chemistry. Um, trying to simulate an early earth environment and see how uh, chemicals can uh, interact with each other to create a lifelike system. Um, and then I, I did research with this lab, actually, um, that was my next lab. And I had to do it all on Zoom because that was when the university was shut down during COVID. So actually I was doing a lot of work just from my computer and I was joining Zoom lab meetings and uh, doing uh, statistical uh, analysis with uh, their work on my computer. Um, and then, so that was a large reason that I did a rotation when I started graduate school is because I only had in-person experience in one lab. And I wanted to make sure that I was getting enough experience in different labs that I knew the decision I was making was correct. In the old days, <laughs> before COVID, um, we might have used P32 or S35 radioactive nucleotides to pulse chase the proteins. Do people use those anymore at all, or have the fluorescent dyes supplanted all that? Um, I have read uh, research where they they uh, use uh, radioactive carbon to to study uh, carbon uh, use in in plants. Um, we, as far as I know, have not done that in my lab. Um, we primarily use um, uh, GFP or yeah. tagged proteins and with some other fluorescent protein uh, with electron microscopes that uh, GFP won't be useful. So you have um, uh, something called uh, immunostaining where you can um, detect um, protein locations in the cell uh, using electron microscopy as well. Other questions? I'd like to say you did an outstanding job of clarity and depth. Wonderful. Time. I hope it was interesting. Thank you. And here's my sources. <laughs> All right. So, shall I stop sharing on Zoom? Yeah, that'd be great.